Hey, y'all, welcome to the Marty Smith podcast here at Outsider Studios in Nashville, Tennessee. Trace Adkins has had an amazing career here in Music City, and he's celebrating his 25th year as a recording artist in country music with a brand new album. And he came by Outsider Studios to spend some time with me to discuss his path to this 25th year, what he sees when he looks in the rearview mirror back over such a great career. I also wondered things like how he carries rural Louisiana with him everywhere he goes. You guys may not know he was a roughneck on an oil rig before he moved to Nashville to chase the neon rainbow. Absolutely fascinating dude. One thing I love about him is he don't back up and he don't back down. He knows exactly who he is. Like it or not, that's what he's going to be. Here's Trace Adkins on the Marty Smith Podcast here at Outsider Studios. All right, so we'll get started going back a few years. I'm in college, all right? And messing around in this apartment I had with my degenerate buddies, and I hear this voice, I hear this song all the way down the hall and around the corner on the TV. And I walk down the hall and on the screen is this black and white video on the CMT. And this stunning woman with these crystal eyes and this song is blowing my mind. Every light in the house. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we got to go back a few years. All right. All right. That was a long time ago, man. Yeah, what? that was nineteen ninety six or seven. Ninety six. That that it. Yeah, my first single came out in ninety six. So every light in the house zone may have either come out at the end of ninety six or early ninety seven. But that was. That was my first legitimate hit. My first single, I think it got to number 18 or something like that. So it, it wasn't a failure, but Every Light in the House is On is the song that set the table for everything to come after. You know. As you look in the rear view, right? I know you're looking forward, got a brand new record out and the whole thing, but it's hard to look back when you're in the middle of it. But as you look, I mean, it's 25 years. Mm. What do you see? Well, I've spent a lot of time this year looking back because this is my 25th anniversary, so I'm, I am reflecting back on, on everything um, that's happened to me over my career, and it's been an incredible ride, and I'm incredibly grateful to have had the experience. And, and you know, I look back and I can see lessons that I learned and blessings that I had and uh, just everything. It's been fun to just kind of just take some time and look back and when we were doing this new album you know that it it was a lot of looking back while we were doing these brand new songs because it was almost like every one of them was like something that i, I put it in a i was like that reminds me of that song that i did <laughs> on the third album or whatever you know and this is like i don't know my 14th album now or something but i remember all of them and it's been a that was a long, rambling answer to your question, but it's been fun looking back. But it's awesome. It's so hard to have sustainability here. It, it just, I mean, it, there's not many guys who do it for that long. What, what, yeah. what it, what's been the recipe? I think somebody, somebody told me one time that um, if you take every artist that's ever come out in country music and they had that single that got released to radio or whatever, if you average out the careers, the average career is about five years. That's about how long that you can expect to last on average in this business. And uh, man, I've way exceeded my life, <laughs> is, my life expectancy. So yeah, I'm just glad to still be around. And I don't know what to attribute that to, man. I've done what I wanted to do and uh, did the songs I wanted to do, made the albums I wanted to make. and did the kind of music I wanted to make and uh, for, you know, stuck around. So it's hard to do that in this town too. You strike me as a guy who isn't born to pander. You know, you say right there, I wrote what I wanted, I sang what I wanted, I did what I wanted. What's the challenge of doing that in this town? Not many guys get to do that. Well, because you have to, you have to walk that fine line, you know, you have to, 
you have to make decisions via committee in certain circumstances, and you have to be willing to compromise with the people at the record label and stuff because they've got their ideas and they they decide what they think is commercial on the new album that you've done, and so you have to have those discussions and 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 keep an open mind when you enter into these these conversations with the suits that they may know what they're talking about, you know? <laughs> may. You know, may. They may know what they're talking <laughs> about, so you got to listen to them and let them, let them make their presentation and show you the numbers and show, show you what their research, because they used to do these focus things where they'd take three or four of your songs and they'd play them for a focus group and see what they all thought about each one. And, and that's how they would come to you to say, this is why we think this song ought to be the next single. And, you know, you'd have to listen to that stuff. But in the end, I always told myself, whether it was true or not, I always maintained veto power, mm -hmm. you know. Look, it's my face on the front of the album cover, and it's my voice on the record, so I'm going to be the final say. I'll listen to what you guys say, but if I don't agree with you in the end, I'm going to... I'm going to make the decision I want to make. And I've done that a few times where it bit me solidly on the buttocks and left marks. I've picked singles that were just dismal failures that didn't work. You what know? were they? Well, Brown Chicken, Brown Cow was one that I can think of right off the top of my head. I fought hard for that song, and they were like, look, we think that maybe 60% of the of the radio stations will play it and there's going to be 40% of them that won't touch it. And I said, I can live with 60%. But the problem was it turned out the other way around. Mm -hmm. There were about 40% <laughs> that would play it and 60 never touched it. So that's one that I can think of. But there have been a couple of other ones that I thought, you know, just because I liked the song so much and thought it was funny or catchy or whatever, not everybody agreed with me. And, you know, hey, that's all right. I read uh, in studying for our time today that you feel like this is your best work you feel like you're at the absolute top of your game at this stage in your career you know what is it that leads you to feel that way well it wasn't just because i thought that i've mickey jack combs who produced this record along with Derek george um i've been working with mickey for probably 15 years uh, he he started out engineering sessions that i did and um so he's been in the studio with me for a long time. And he said to me this, this past year, he said, this is the best I've ever heard you sing. He said, I've been working with you for 15 years. I said, you know why? Because it's the first time that I've done a record since 1995 that my voice was rested whenever I was going in the studio. Because, you know, like every other artist in every other genre of music, I spent last year in the studio because there wasn't anything else to do. And it afforded me the opportunity to go in and sing on a Friday or whatever and then rest for a week and go back in and sing again. I haven't had anything. I haven't had that opportunity in years, decades. I mean, I'm constantly working, you know, and... And maybe the most I would get would be a week's rest, but that's coming off of a 20-show run, you know what I mean? So I think it shows in, in, in this record that my voice was rested. My range is better than it's ever been. And I, it's, I thought, wow, what a shame. You know, I think after 25 years, <laughs> I finally figured this thing out, and I'm doing the best work of my career, and nobody gives a shit. That's not true. That's true, that's man. That's not true. You know, isn't that? That's, that's, I was like, wow. But you know what, man? I'm not. That's cool, man. I had my turn at bat, you know. I had the radio thing, and I was getting played on the radio, and it was all good. And I'm not saying I can't get played on radio anymore, but I haven't for the last few years. That's okay, though. I mean, if they find something off of this new record they want to play on the radio, knock yourself out. You know? Why is the business like that? Like, why, why is it's it? It's flavor of the month, man. I mean, unless you, unless you establish yourself in that rarefied air up there of superstardom, those guys get the hall pass. They can do whatever they want, you know, and they can ride that thing on into the sunset. But if you don't reach that, then you got to fight for, you know, all the way, you know, and that's cool with me. I don't, and I told somebody the other day, I, I said, you know, I think I've had the perfect level of success. I mean, as, as far as celebrity, 
I get the perks of, that come along with being the celebrity, but I can still go to Home Depot and not cause a ruckus. Blake can't go anywhere. Yeah, I mean, he can't go anywhere unless he's in Tishmingo. They let him wander around there and don't don't cause much of a fuss. But he goes anywhere else, you know. I mean, he can't. I mean, people go crazy, you know. I don't get that very much, you know. So I think it's just perfect. You've you've. Had- Put together so many unique collaborations on the new record too. I mean, you got Pitbull on there. You yeah. got Snoop. Snoop. You got Snoop a Loop on yeah. there. I sang. Were on... y'all in the studio together, or was no. he there and you're here? No. Okay. I sang on one of Snoop's records years ago. He had did this. He covered this old Johnny Cash song called "Bring Me My Medicine," and I did a, a bass part on the track. You know. So I was like, "You're going to have to repay the favor someday," <laughs> you know. And he was like, "Yeah, no problem." So. Yeah, so he wrote a verse for this song, and and uh, he just blew me away. It was so good, and uh, I really, really appreciate Snoop doing this with us. It was hey. awesome. Stevie Wonder played harmonica on a track on this. I couldn't believe that. That just that happened because we share an attorney, and and my attorney made that happen. He he played this song that I did with Keb Mo, which hats off to Keb too, man. He's awesome. I love. Keb, he's a Grammy-making machine, you know, but he played that song for Stevie Wonder, and Stevie wanted to play harmonica on it, and he did, and I'm just so grateful. I mean, what a musical genius that guy is. And uh, and then Blake is on a track yep. with me, and Luke Bryan, and so, yeah, um, we had some great collaborations on this project, and I appreciate, appreciate all of them. How'd you react when your attorney called and said, hey, I, I got to talk to you about something? Yeah, I was like, uh, you know, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, sure, Stevie Wonder is going to you know, play harmonica on this. Okay. So, you know, I was skeptical about it, excited, but I always temper my excitement in this business because I've learned over the years and most of the time you hear stuff like that it ends up not happening and most of that happens in movie world or television world though you know somebody will come to you with an idea for a project and be all stoked about it and you get it you allow yourself to get excited yeah, about it and then it never happens yeah. you know uh how did acting and your your entrance and foray into the acting world impact your kind of vision as an artist or your philosophy as an artist? Um, I don't think it affected anything as far as the way I approach music, the records I make and, and you know, what I do on stage um, during live performances. It hasn't affected that at all. It's just something else that I enjoy doing and I really do. I get a kick out of it. I. I that. What is it? What is it about it? Well, first of all, it's a challenge, you know, because you're getting out of your comfort zone and going into an area. And I always tell people, you know, quietly, my, the best acting job I do is not letting the director know that I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so that's a challenge to try to do perform well enough that they don't know that you're just you know you don't know what you're doing so but i love it man and i tell people my favorite days in the music business are still those days when you go in the studio on tracking days with six or eight of the most talented musicians in the world because that's the pool that we have to draw from here in this town these are the these are some of the best musicians in the world and you get to go in the studio with these guys and take something raw and and watch it hopefully turn into something unbelievable and beautiful and the creativity that that whole environment and atmosphere on those days you're surrounded by these incredibly talented people and that's what it's like on a television set or on a film set you know you're surrounded by incredibly talented people you know from the people on the crew the camera guys the producer director everybody the other actors and I just find that stimulating. I, I, I get off on it. I like it. One of the coolest opportunities in, inter- I'll call it entertainment, kind of both of our businesses, is the opportunity for your voice to be coveted in a VO, in a voiceover <laughs> format. You've become 
Like Sam Elliott is one of those like iconic. You're in that. You're you're there, man. You're that iconic voice that people hear it. They know it. They know exactly who it is, and companies covet it. What's that part of your life? I, that's it's awesome. I love it. That's yeah. the easiest money a Stand man can right make. Stand right in front of this microphone and talk about Firestone tires. And not on camera. Right. So I can go in there wearing my overalls. I just got <laughs> off the tractor. Go down there and do my Firestone commercials or whatever they may be, you know, Farmer Boys. Uh, I've, I've done a lot of them over the years. You know, it's funny you mentioned Sam. Uh, probably about 10 or 12 years ago when I was really starting to make a few inroads into that side of the business, trying to do some voiceover stuff, Sam had gotten the last two things that I auditioned for. Sam got both of them. Beef. Yeah. And then he did the Union Pacific Railroad. He got that one, too. And he got the Dodge truck. Anyway, he had gotten, and I auditioned for every one of those. And I told my agent, I said, I tell you what, get a box and put every CD that I've ever done in it and send it to Sam and tell him if he can learn to sing those songs, I won't ever have to leave the house. You know, I'm tired of it. Just do that too, Sam. You know? Have you ever met him? No, uh, I want to, though. I really would like to meet him someday. He's been a hero of mine. He's a legend, man. I love that guy. All the movies he's done. Yeah. How um, much do you still carry rural Louisiana with you uh, every day? Yeah, it's who I am. You know, I tell people, um, people can't understand it. I, I grew up and um, I started working in the oil field when I quit playing football. And went straight to work in the oil field. Then I went offshore and worked on a drilling rig for six years, and you know I roughnecked and ended up working derricks. And and I tell people, you know, I'm not a singer that used to roughneck. I'm a roughneck that sings. I still carry that same mentality with me, that same you know work ethic and approach to whatever my job may be, you know. Um, that's what I'm going to do. I'm not a diva. I don't complain about stuff. It's just not who I am, you know. Um, and there's that probably, unfortunately, I still carry that machismo that comes from that job and growing up in that part of the country, you know, that might be offensive to some people, but I'm not going to apologize for it. What, what, okay, so like walk me through a day as somebody who's completely ignorant about what roughnecking, oh, yeah. it, walk me through what that means, what that is. Well, I mean, it depends on what part of the drilling process you're actually in. You're drilling the oil well, and let's say you're 12,000 feet deep and you've got however many joints of 30 foot pipe it takes to get that far, then the bit wears out. So you have to pull all that pipe back out of the hole to replace the bit and go back in. And they want you to do it as quickly as you possibly can, you know. And that's a strenuous, I mean, I've had to have surgery on both my elbows because of the joints and the tendons that from jacking pipe in a derrick for so long, it just, it just wore out my joints, you know. And, uh, but I loved it. You know, it was fun and more dangerous it got. You know, if if I got to do a hitch where I got where I drew hazardous duty pay, that was my favorite <laughs> hitch. You know, because yeah, if you need to send somebody on a riding belt over the side of the rig to do something and hang over the water and do all, I'll do it. Let's go. <laughs> so that's the kind of stuff I did. But Derek hands do that kind of stuff. So any Derek hands watching this know what I'm talking about. That finger. Yeah, I cut it off uh, on a drilling rig and had to sit there for about six hours till they got a helicopter out to, you know. That was the funny thing. As soon as I cut it and it just kind of fell back like that, you know, I, the first thing I thought, boy, it's going to be hard to make bar cords now. <laughs> you know, it's like they're just, they're, they're cords I can't make anymore because I can't reach, you know, with that finger. So, but that was the first thing I thought about when I cut it off. When did Nashville, when did you say, I'm going there, I'm chasing this? 92. Um, I'd quit singing and I'd gone back to work in the oil field because I'd taken a leave of absence and, and it was supposed to be for six months, but it turned into about five years. I, <laughs> I was playing beer joints in Texas and in New Mexico. And uh, anyway, I got burnt out and I quit and I went back to work in the oil field. And, 
And then one day, a guy who had booked me in those clubs out there called me, and he had, he had since moved to Nashville, John Milam. I, I love that guy. Bless his God rest his soul. Um, he called me one day, and he said, are you singing anymore? And I said, I don't even sing in the shower. I'm done. You know, it's, it's not going to happen for me. And he said, well, one of these days you're going to have to look in the mirror and ask yourself the question, I wonder what would have happened if. And I said, if what? And he said, if you'd have thrown down the pom-poms and gotten the game, he said, you need to be in Nashville. That's where the factory is that makes what you want to be. And I thought about what he said, you know, and the thought of actually literally doing that, facing myself in the mirror when I was 60 years old and asking myself the question, I wonder what would have happened if. And that the thought of that scared me worse than quitting my job and selling my house and moving to Nashville, you know, with my kids. And that's what I did, you know. Fortunately, I mean, I had a blue collar background, so I moved up here and I went to work in construction out at uh, Old Hickory at the DuPont plant. And so I was able to do that for a couple of years until I got hooked up with the right people. And there you go. Yeah, what was the break? I uh, met uh, the newly named uh, president of Capital Records at the baggage claim at the airport. What? And introduced myself to him and, and he uh, asked me if, you know, I told him I was a big fan of everything he had produced and all that stuff. And he asked me if I was singing. I said, yeah, I got a little gig out at a club outside of town. I play on the weekends. And he asked me where it was, and I told him. And not thinking he would show up, you know. He came and then um, walked up on the stage in between one of my sets and said, I was putting my guitar on the stand. I turned around. He was standing right there on the stage. He said, I'll give you a record deal. Just like that. And I was like. God, where have you been? I've been looking for you, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so he told me later, he said, he said, when I met you, he said, I heard the timbre of your voice. And I thought, if this guy can sing on pitch, you know, we may have something here. So that's why he came out and he signed me to Capitol Records and produced my first platinum record and all that. And there we went. That's so cool. Scott Hendricks, yeah. I, I, I give him credit for where I am today. I mean, thank God he walked in and took a chance on me and, and I'll always be eternally grateful. You were talking about fame. You start getting singles on the radio, you start having success, awards are coming, videos, the whole thing, right? How, what's it like to make sure you stay centered? Like, what's that challenge? Oh, man, well, it's one that I didn't meet, I'm afraid. I mean, you know, you get caught up in some of that stuff sometimes and you kind of go crazy. I, I, it's, it's, it's hard for, I don't know how anybody would make that transition and go through that and not go crazy for at least a moment, yeah. you know. Um, and, you, and every time that I kind of did, you know, there were long-lasting repercussions, you know. So I didn't ever get, I paid for every mistake I made, you know, and uh, so I didn't get off scot-free. So I can't really give anybody else any advice as to how to keep it together, you know, when those things start happening, when success, when success, unimagined success starts coming your way, you know, how do you deal with that, you know? That's a tough one. You gotta have, you gotta be surrounded by really competent, you know, people that can help guide you and that's the best you can do. Generally, what advice would you give young artists when they come to town? Well, just that. I mean, I was very fortunate in that um, Scott Hendricks, who signed me to Capitol Records, he had a clean slate to work with. He said, this is who I think ought to be your manager. This is who I think ought to be your booking agent. This is who I think awesome. ought to be your attorney or the firm that you go with. And man, he gave me such good advice, and and so I had a I had a head start, you know, on everybody else. I had that going for me, and uh, so I got some really good advice from some people in the very beginning. But when when I do from time to time have somebody ask me for advice, what what you know, can you give me any advice? I'm a young guy starting out. My it's always, and they probably think that I'm just dismissing them when I say it, but I'm not. Some guy told me this when I first moved to town a long time ago. He said, don't spend your own money. Mm. Don't spend your own money. Wow. If somebody believes in you enough, you won't 
they won't ask you to spend your own money. You know, they're going to find an investor or they're going to spend their money and they're going to promote you and, and pay to cut records on you and pay to get you in the studio, those kinds of things, you know. Uh, steer clear of those shysters that are going to say, if you can come up with 20 grand, I can put you in the studio and we'll cut something and I can put it in front of the right people. Run from those guys. There's still a few of them around. A couple more things. Uh, what impact did The Apprentice have on your ability to walk down the street? Yeah, it 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 was different. Yeah, it people started recognizing me, and it was yeah my cue exponentially went up. Yeah, no question about it. And I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. And and, and when I went the first time, I thought, okay, you know, maybe I can go up here and and uh, you know and and get some raise some awareness for the food allergy you know thing that I'm working for. Because I had a, I have a daughter with severe food allergies, and so that was near and dear to my heart. And if I can, if I can just strike a blow for that and raise some awareness, that'll be good. And then I'll go back home. And and I think I'd been there, kind of kept my head down for the first week or two. And then I thought, you know what? These guys don't have more game than I do. <laughs> I can win this thing if I want to. And then I said, okay, I'm going to win it. And so I stayed, and I, I lost to Piers Morgan because he raised a lot more money than I did. So, you know. But uh, then when they came around and said, we want to do the all-star version of the Celebrity Apprentice, would you come do it? And I thought, yeah, I'll not make the mistakes I made the first time, and I'll come out of the gate hard, and I'll win this thing. And that's what I did. And then... And it helped me, yeah. A lot more people know who I am because of Celebrity Apprentice. You or your your team, whomever does your social media, I laughed out loud, man. There's this clip they put on there of you talking to the Backstreet Boys. Oh, yeah. About Wheatgrass Surprise or something. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, Those guys. I laughed my ass off. I, I laughed my ass off. Yeah. You know, after all that was over, you know, um, I, I got back home and, and their manager reached out to my manager and wanted me to go do this thing on social media because they were really getting some flack from the way they acted on that show. And they wanted me to come out and say it was all a joke and it was all done for the cameras and all that kind of stuff. And I said, no, because it wasn't. That's how they really are. I'm not going to come out and say that it was all a joke and done for the cameras. They're a bunch of crybaby divas, <laughs> you know, and I don't care. Yeah, How many of them are there? Yeah. 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 We better bring some more guys. <laughs> <laughs> that is fantastic, man. Uh, all right. Two more things. Uh, you, I've taken too much of your time already. Nah, I'm enjoying it, man. I've been a fan. I've been watching you on TV. You get to do the cool stuff. You know, you get to go talk to, you get to do the... Yeah, you got a good gig, man. I'm very blessed. You're, you're right. Well, thank you. I'm very <laughs> blessed, and I do but love But you do a good segment. job. Well, thank you. Thank you. She thinks we're just fishing. Mm. As a girl dad, mm. I, I, I imagine a lot, I have two daughters. As a girl dad, that song slays. Just It's one of those ones that just drops you. Yeah. What has been the response to that song from, from guys like us who have daughters? That's the funny. I'm glad that you asked you framed the question that way because that's the funniest part, the stuff that I get. I'll see some guy come walking up to me with a beard and tats and, <laughs> you know, and a bandana on his head, just got off of his fat boy, you know, and he comes walking up and there's already a tear in his eye. And he's like, and that fishing song, man, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. Those are the guys that it affects the most, you know, the, the dads that really have thick bark on them. That one hurts, you know, and um, and I'm I'm proud of that, man. I, I I love what that song has done for me, and uh, you know, my good friend Casey Beathard, love him to death. He wrote that when he was looking at his his little girl Charlie fishing, and that's where the song came from. And he gave it to me because he knew that I taught all my girls to fish, and you know, um, and I'm really fortunate that I'm the guy that got to record that. It's so much more, I mean, there's a lot of guys in town who maybe could have written that, 
but for whatever reason, because of your voice and that baritone and how deep it is and stuff, it, it almost hits even harder than had it been someone who maybe doesn't have that same type of delivery. Oh, let's not make fun of those little guys. <laughs> we'll just, no, I understand what you're saying. And I've had a couple, I had a good friend of mine uh, passed away, Kenny Beard, and he told me one time, he said, there's only two kind of songs that they'll let you have on the radio. Sexy, funny, and sappy daddy. Yeah. Those are only That's two it. you get. <laughs> you get sexy, funny, sappy daddy. Thus, hot mama, badonka donk, yep. sexy, funny. You're going to miss this. She thinks we're just fishing. Sappy daddy. Those are my biggest hits. Kenny was right. He was right. Um, Casey was actually sitting in that chair at 8 o'clock this morning. Really? I interviewed him this morning. And you talk about an unbelievable spirit. Oh, yeah. I wow. mean, everything that they've managed. What they've been through as a family over the last couple of years, it's, yeah. Um, I mean, they, yeah, I love the guy. love that whole family. I've watched all those kids grow up. Me too. I, I love him like a brother. Um, all right, give me a, a, a look at what summer's going to be and going into the fall for you guys. Well, we're back to business as usual, finally. You know, we're back on the bus running all over this beautiful country and getting to stand up in front of country music fans and life is good, you know. So we're going to be really busy till the end of August. And that's when I go back on tour with Blake. I think we do about 20-something shows. I don't know how many it is, but that tour runs into October, I guess. And I don't know what I'm doing after that, man, you know, whatever. Um, What's but, it like touring with that knucklehead? Uh, we have we have a great time. I mean, you know, um, there's nobody else in this business that I enjoy being around more than Blake, you know. Yeah, he the, the thing you see on television, you know, him going for the one-liner all the time, and that's the way he is all the time. He's not turning that on for the camera. That's the way he lives his life. He's always going for the laugh. It doesn't matter. And so when we're together, you know, we just laugh all the time. I laugh because he's really, he's not that smart. You know, <laughs> some of the stuff that he does is legitimately stupid because, you know. So, uh. so I just laugh at him. And, but I feel, I have to, feel like I have to take care of him. You know, got to protect him, you know, from himself. And so it's kind of the relationship we have, big brother kind of thing. I love it. Hey, thank you. All right. I thank really you. appreciate your insight and time and, and time above enjoyed all. enjoyed it, man. Thank you, brother. Thanks thank a lot. Thank you so much. All right, admission time. That's a pretty intimidating dude. Um, you sit in with him and ask him open-ended questions where you hope that he'll humor you and tell you about his life and I was really grateful that he did that. I loved learning about how he carries that roughneck mentality with him everywhere. I love the vulnerability that when you try to make your way through this gauntlet that is the country music industry and you have to stick to your guns when you believe it. There's a lot of politics involved in that and what it does to you when you do that. There is almost invariably fallout that comes from that. And Trace was very open with us there on what that's like. But he has never compromised. And I do appreciate the fact that he was willing to be so honest with us about that. What a great person. Thank you guys for taking the time to hang out with us here on the Marty Smith Podcast. Do me a favor. Please subscribe, rate, and review. If you love country music, if your buddies love country music, tell them about it. We would love to bring more and more people into the outsider family. We're going to do amazing things here. We're building something really special, and we're all really proud to have that opportunity. You guys are a huge part of that. Be well. Thank you so much for listening.